Dutch were going to war over the Solomon Islands next. If you thought that Ukraine was difficult to find on the map or understand the near and distant history, try the Solomon Islands. Uh, the proximate reason for my bringing it up so early in the broadcast is that Germany, once mighty Germany, then peaceful Germany, now warlike Germany again, has just issued a warning to the government of the Solomon Islands. I'll give you a clue just to save you looking up your atlas. The Solomon Islands is 2,000 miles away from Australia, so quite a long way from Germany. You might well wonder why the German government took time out from its busy schedule of saving the collapsing economy of the mightiest economy in the European Union to deal with the issue of the Solomon Islands. Well, it was all about solidarity with Australia. Australia has said in the middle of an Australian general election, mind you, that it may invade the Solomon Islands 2,000 miles from its shores if it goes ahead with a security pact which its sovereign government has concluded with the People's Republic of China. I know you think I'm making all this up, but I am not. It is a cause of war for Australia and even for Germany and by extension NATO that a tiny country called the Solomon Isles should have a pact with China. But it is not a cause of war for Russia if Ukraine, 200 miles from Moscow, decides to join NATO and allow NATO military bases, by which I mean American military bases and American weapons, by which I mean potentially American nuclear weapons, 200 miles from Moscow, a blink of an eye, no time to put up a barrage balloon, never mind intercept it with uh, anti-missile technology. That's not a cause of war. Russia has been condemned and sanctioned, more of which later, uh, by virtually every country in the so-called Western world over Ukraine, whilst we are about to be drawn into a war over the Solomon Islands. Now, I didn't know where they were either. I knew even less about their history. But it turns out that the northern Solomon Islands were, a hundred years ago, possessions of Germany. They were colonies of Germany. And the southern Solomon Islands were colonies of, uh, who was it again? Yes, Britain. Britain was the colonial overlord of South Solomon Islands and Germany, the colonial overlord of the north. You see how the colonial countries keep returning like a dog to the scene of its own vomit. We are imagining that we have the right to tell the Solomon Islands what to do. Well, I can understand it because we've always told them what to do. But the Solomon Islands now has a government that won't be told what to do. Like Pakistan used to have until a couple of weeks ago, and I'll turn to that issue in a minute also. So keep your eye on the Solomon Islands. Be prepared for the Blue Tick Brigade to become... Uh, absolute experts on the Solomon Island and the threat to Australia, threat of them having a mutual defense pact with China. One way or another, we are steaming towards conflict with China. That's because the conflict with Russia isn't going too well. It's going so badly that Antony Blinken, the American Secretary of State said today, this day, that the two parties should return to the negotiating table. 
and that America would support a solution to the conflict which involved Ukraine declaring its neutrality, that it would never join NATO. I'm afraid that ship, Secretary Blinken, has sailed. That ship has well and truly sailed. Such a promise would not be worth the paper it isn't written on, either from you or from the coup regime in Kiev, because you're actually arming, garrisoning, sending special forces and mercenaries and more weapons than your inventory can afford to send to NATO to Ukraine already, and it isn't even in NATO. So what good would it do Russia for Ukraine merely to declare its neutrality if you were going to continue to supply it with military personnel, training, money, and above all, hardware? The Americans have given Ukraine so many weapons that they are themselves running out. 40%. Uh, of their anti-tank munitions have been depleted. And the MOD in the United States said that Ukraine was getting through a week's worth of anti-tank munitions every single day of the war. Not that there's much evidence uh, that they are hitting Russian tanks, still less stopping Russian tanks in their tracks. As a matter of fact, as I said last week, many of them will probably be appearing for sale on the dark web right now. If I knew where the dark web was, I could have checked that, but I don't. But I know people who do, and I'm sure that that's where much of the material given to the corrupt Ukrainian regime has ended up. I'm not saying they're corrupt now. I'm not discovering how corrupt they are. The World Bank and the IMF over the last few years have repeatedly warned them that if they did not cut back on the corruption, and the bar is quite high on that, then the World Bank and the IMF would no longer fund them. The European Union didn't have any interest in admitting Ukraine to the European Union, partly because it would become a tremendous burden on the taxpayers of the EU, on the net contributors to the EU, but partly because of its well-charted corruption. So we are absolutely in bed, fornicating daily and nightly with a regime stuffed with Nazis and fascists and a byword for corruption. The president, it was revealed in the Pandora Papers, has a personal fortune of more than $500 million, including a $31.4 million villa in Florida, as you do when you are just two years the president of the poorest country in Europe, namely Ukraine. The war has uh, overwhelmingly turned. That's why Blinken made the statement that he did today. That's why even Germany, is very reluctant indeed to continue to supply heavy weaponry to the Kiev regime, partly because much of it gets destroyed before it reaches the battlefield. Other uh, significant portions of it uh, get blown up in the arms depots uh, by Russia's missile offensive, and partly because a lot of it gets nicked. So the war will either have to come to a negotiated end very quickly, and the terms will not be only uh, the uh, declared neutrality of Ukraine. They'll now have to be much more significant than that. That would have stopped the war uh, before it started, but given all the sacrifice that has been made, it won't stop it now. So what are they going to do, the Ukrainians? How are they going to draw NATO deeper into the maw, deeper into the, the morass of killing that the Russia-Ukraine war has become. Well, a new wheeze has just emerged. Having confused you with the Solomon Islands, let me try you with Transnistria. 
Transnistria is a breakaway part of Moldova, which is itself a breakaway part of Romania. And then there's the Carpathian Hungarians, who never wanted to be in Ukraine in the first place. They are now holding rallies, demanding their reunification with Hungary. The First World War, you'll remember, uh, was all about the Balkans. It started in the Balkans and it became about uh, the redrawing of all these maps in Balkan countries. It's coming again, if you let it. If you're ready for your children to sacrifice their lives if they're in the armed forces, if you're ready to sacrifice your standard of life in a crashing economy, you'll be right behind the Carpathian Hungarians or maybe the Ukrainian right to hold on to the Carpathian Hungarians. You might be ready even to sacrifice your firstborn for the liberation of Transnistria or Moldova or Romania for that matter. I be perfectly frank with you. I don't care all that much about Transnistria. I don't care whether it breaks away from Moldova. I don't care if it joins up with the People's Republics in eastern Ukraine. At least I don't care beyond any kind thought I have for the people who live there. In terms of geopolitics, I really don't care. And I'm not ready to fight World War III over Transnistria, are you? But you might have to. Because over the last 48, 72 hours, Ukrainian soldiers wearing Moldovan army uniforms have begun a series of military maneuvers and terrorist actions in Transnistria. Now, here's the rub. The Transnistrians are Russian-speaking people, the Russian ethnic people. They've even got Lenin's eleven playing in the Champions League this year. They beat Real Madrid 3-0 away from home. They've got Lenin's statue outside their stadium. I forget their name now. But the reality is, if there's an invasion of Transnistria, then Russia will respond to it as it did to the invasion or threat of one uh, to the people of the Donbass. They weren't prepared to put up with another eight years of murderous attrition against Russian-speaking people in Donbass. And when they knew that there was about to be a renewed offensive by the Kiev forces against the Donbass, that's when they decided to invade. They'll do the same in Transnistria, if I'm any judge. I, despite what it says on Twitter, have nothing to do with Russia, nothing to do with its government, nothing to do with its media. I am not speaking for Russia, but I have been around a long time. I do know a fair bit about international politics. I've even got a book published in Romanian on the Ceausescu's, the downfall of the Ceausescu's. Not many people can say they've got a book published in Romania that sat in the British Parliament, but I can. So I know what I'm talking about. And if there is an invasion of Transnistria, there'll be another invasion of it by Russia. But that will mean that the Russian offensive will have to travel some distance and encircle Odessa in order to reach Transnistria, which will make the ending of the war more difficult. But when it does end, it will mean the end of the Ukrainian state as we know it. Now, as I have said from the beginning, that's not what I want. It's not what I wanted before the war began, and it's not what I want now. I wanted the Minsk agreement to be implemented. After all, Ukraine, guaranteed by France and Germany, said that they would implement it, but they never did. But we are undoubtedly, with this Transnistrian issue now arising, are moving into the political territory of the partition of Ukraine, 
with the Hungarians maybe taking back their part of it, taken from them by the Soviet Union and given to Ukraine. Imagine. So, and then you might get the Poles deciding, well, they would like Lvov or Lviv, as it's now called, back, because that was an historic and beautiful Polish city, which was taken from them in the Second World War settlement at the behest of the Soviet Union. Again, go figure. The Soviet Union made the Ukraine in the borders that it uh, occupied prior to the beginning of this Russian invasion. And so there'll be two countries. There'll be an Eastern Ukraine, a kind of Novorus, I think they may well call it, because they can't have all these separate states. They may merge into one. They may even ask to join the Russian Federation. Maybe Belarus will do the same, and we'll have a new country called Novorussia, New Russia. And that will leave the least fertile, least economically productive, least populous part of Ukraine to be a burden forevermore to the European Union and to NATO. What a great achievement our statespeople have guided us to. All of this killing, blood, destruction, to end up with a tiny Ukraine with no vast agricultural lands because all of the most fertile lands are in the east and south of the country, which will all form part of a Russian-dominated new formation, maybe even a new country. Ukraine was the second biggest producer of wheat in the world. Russia was the biggest producer of wheat in the world. Russia will now be the biggest producer of wheat and will be effectively in alliance with, maybe even within its own territory, almost all of the agricultural riches of East and South Ukraine. What a triumph for the NATO. What a triumph for the West. As I have been saying throughout this crisis, we have struggled mightily to lift a huge stone only to drop it on our own feet. And that's nowhere more true than in the issue of oil and gas. Today, we've had a parade of ruritarian governments like the Bulgarian government, a ruritarian fantasy of a state entirely dependent on the European Union and on the remittances of its workforce, which has all been forced to leave Bulgaria and work in more developed, more industrialized, Western European countries. Bulgaria is refusing to pay for its gas in rubles. So its gas has been cut off. Just the same, really. If I told my gas supplier here in England I was refusing to pay their bill in pounds, well, I wouldn't have gas for very long. If I was insisting to pay my British gas bill in rubles, I promise you they would not accept it. But Bulgaria thought it was being clever. It refused to pay in rubles. So as of this day, Russia has ceased the supply of gas to Bulgaria, meaning the rest of the European Union will have to, at its expense, supply the gas to Bulgaria. Ditto Poland which is, of course, a much more significant country, much more significant economy, but they're refusing also. But they're going to buy the Russian gas from Germany. You see where I'm going here? This is the kind of idiotic schoolyard games that we're playing. In what way are you not buying Russian gas if you're buying Russian gas from Germany? Now, maybe they're hoping the Germans will sell it to them at a discount. Maybe they feel Germany owes them. I'd probably agree, actually, with my knowledge of the history of relations between Germany and Poland. But that may be what they are up to. Thank God Britain's not in the European Union, or we'd be having to pay some of the price 
of all of this maneuvering. But five countries have already, without announcing, opened ruble accounts at the Gazprom Bank and are going to pay their bills in rubles because the truth is that the European Union cannot function without Russian oil and gas. Whatever they say, and they say plenty, but they do different under the counter, and they'll have to continue to do so. America cannot make up the shortfall in gas with its uh, shale uh, product, more expensive, much more expensive than Russian gas, and all the terminals at which it would have to come in have to be substantially remodeled to allow the American ships in. And then we'll be in Europe dependent on the United States until Donald Trump comes back and then all bets will be off again. The madness of crowds is what we are experiencing here. The politicians hype up the war talk the media amplifies it, the public go mad, and the politicians feed off the madness of the crowds. But as I said last week, it only takes one dog to herd an entire flock of sheep. But eventually, these sheep are for the knacker's yard. The lamb spends its whole life worrying about the wolf, but ends up being eaten by the shepherd. And eventually, the working class of Europe are going to have to wake up that for Transnistria or for any one of the alphabet soup of eastern Ukrainian towns and villages that none of us can pronounce, none of us knew where they were, for them to provoke Russia, we have created a mighty crisis which is affecting not Russia, but us. The Russian economy is doing just fine. The Chinese economy doing even better. China announced today uh, that it has established a massive, everything is massive in China, task force tasked with the purpose of overhauling the American economy even faster than it was scheduled to do so. The sun is rising in the east. Russia has now been forced out of the west to the east. People like Nixon and Kissinger and Brzezinski, who spent their whole careers trying to keep Russia and China as far apart from each other as possible, have now made Russia and China effectively one country, one economy, one military with one foreign policy, the rejection of American domination. And there's only one winner in that contest. And increasingly, countries like India and countries like Iran, countries like Brazil, South Africa, Pakistan, Bangladesh, the Latin American continent will be drawn ineluctably towards the Eurasian entity which George Orwell almost predicted, remember when he said Oceania has always been at war with East Asia in 1984? Well, it's Eurasia, not East Asia, and it includes a gigantic hinterland and most, easily most, of the world's population. I reiterate a point I need to because so many people haven't grasped it. The so-called West that we have grown up imagining was the international community. Mr. Ben used to joke, I know half of the international community because I know Tony Blair. And Tony Blair and George Bush are the international community. Well, of course, they're not. Only 12% of the population of the world live in the countries that define themselves as the West, even when they're not in the West, like Australia, which likes to be West, but is in fact very far from it. 12%. And if you look at children, only 3% of the 
children of the world are from the white Western populations. I'm leaving out the immigrant population because who knows what's going to happen with them in the future. One hopes that they will continue to be a vital part of our multicultural societies. But as things begin to get uglier and uglier for us in the West, who will bet against revanchist, racist, and even worse, forces re-emerging in Europe, in North America, against the visible minorities in their midst? Fascism arises for a reason. It doesn't arise out of thin air arises out of real material conditions, which we are busily creating for ourselves here in what we call the West. Now, one country which was on track to be a vital part of that Eurasian future was Pakistan. Imran Khan managed to bring about an American-inspired regime change operation precisely because at one and the same time he was buying gas and wheat from Russia and deepening the already uh, fantastically close relationship that Pakistan has always had with China. To be a friend of China was bad enough for Pakistan. To be a friend of both China and Russia at the same time was immediately unconscionable for Joe Biden's White House. And so the order went out and the purse strings were opened and the MPs were purchased and the vote of no confidence went through and the courts were opened at midnight in a court circuit that can barely get out of bed before 10 o'clock in the morning and the new government which reads like the front page of the police gazette where 70 percent of the cabinet are out on bail charged with corruption on a gargantuan everestian himalayan level of corruption and uh, money laundering have been put in his place and has unleashed as you've seen me talk about before, a mass movement of people larger than has ever been seen in Pakistan before. Now, I don't know if that mass movement will be sustained. I don't know if that mass movement will be subverted, further corrupted and divided. Uh, but if it is maintained, if the marchers who were in Peshawar and Karachi and Lahore begin the long march to Islamabad in their millions, then no force on earth will be able to stand against them. The Pakistani armed forces will not fire upon them, whatever the corrupted top brass in the army might imagine. And the airplanes will be full of the imported government going back into exile. There's a lot of ifs in that story, I'll grant you. Uh, but it is nonetheless a story that we will continue to watch here on the Galloway Show midweek, but even more importantly in the mother of all talk shows, which goes out on Sundays. Our audience last Sunday, we haven't uh, tabulated yet, but it's almost certainly going to be the biggest audience the mother of all talk shows has ever addressed. Bigger even than the one when General Soleimani was killed by Donald Trump and it looked like war between the West and the Islamic Republic of Iran. That was our biggest show before this, but I think last Sunday's show will overtake that. The stream on YouTube alone is triple uh, the largest ever stream on YouTube uh, already 
and we are only at Wednesday. This vast uh, global university of the airwaves is something very precious. And as yet, it has no sponsor. I've got to say, somebody's missing a trick. We can deliver you high-quality live television with millions watching all over the globe every single week with production values just as high as any production values to be found on any television channel in the world. And for peanuts, as an advertising spend, as a sponsorship spend, compared to what you would spend on the QVC shopping channel, where virtually nobody is watching, it's a gift. But so far we have not concluded any negotiation with any potential sponsor. So if you know any, if you are a potential sponsor, please get in touch with us. Negotiations continue uh, with a couple of quite important and absolutely, uh, uh, whatever the word is, the synergy between them and us would be perfect as long as nobody ever tried to interfere in the content of the show, tried to somehow influence what it is that I think and say, we'd be delighted to reach agreement with them. But until we do, we need your support. And that's why I make no apology for asking you, the most dedicated of the mother of all talk shows audience, because you're watching on a Wednesday too, uh, to donate. I think the details are coming up uh, on the screen. Uh, Moats.tv forward slash donate. And please um, repeat your donation. Two or three people have told me today that they are donating two pounds a week, uh, every week automatically. And that option exists at that site that I've just given you. Moats.tv forward slash donate. Just go to the button that says recurring donation. Next Sunday, we hope to have the ability whereby you can donate by text through your phone. That will be even easier. And we hope that that will be a big success. So uh, these people who gave us two pounds today and who are doing that every week, I take my hat off to you. But I don't need two pounds. I only need one. If every one of you will pledge one dollar, one pound, every week to the mother of all talk shows, our future would be completely secure and we would have no need of sponsors at all. I think I'm worth a dollar for the wisdom I impart, for the uh, entertainment our shows provide, for the balance that we represent to the tidal wave of guff that you're subjected to in the so-called mainstream media. At the very least, you wouldn't want to wake up to discover that we'd had to take the mother of all talk shows off the air because you didn't pay a dollar a week, a pound a week. Okay, uh, that's all I have to say. I'd like to hear what you have to say and I will, of course, respond to it. I'm amazed that countries like Poland and Germany are willing to destroy their own economies for Ukraine. I really hope that people wake up and topple their respective governments. That's from Mario Rossi. Well, Mario, I, I, in the case of Germany, I feel sure that that will happen. The German government, weighed down heavily as it is by the toxic Greens uh, has gone off on one that is so at odds with the national interests of Germany that it must produce an equal and opposite reaction. The Greens and the so-called Social Democrats have made a very serious blunder, one that I don't think Angela Merkel would have made if she was still in charge. But little soldier Schultz, the diminutive corporal, uh, has effectively declared war against Russia. And I don't believe that that's in the interests of the German people, and the signs are that neither do they. Uh, 
uh, Schultz and the Greens have now made enemies, not just of the trade unions, whose members are going to be laid off in enormous numbers, perhaps in their millions, but has made enemies of the German employers. Germany is a great manufacturing powerhouse. Uh, which dominates the economy of the European Union and which sells its manufacture overseas in great numbers. I'm a big customer of German motor cars over my lifetime uh, myself. If you don't have power, if you don't have energy, and if you don't have power and energy at a price that allows you to continue in business making a profit, then your government has betrayed you, and I think that that feeling will grow. Don't, we're looking at the spring now. We're just humans. We're not manufacturers. And we're thinking the sun's shining. We don't need the fire on. We don't need the gas on. But, of course, the oil and the gas is powering everything that we do. It's powering our workplace, powering the heating, powering the air conditioning, powering the machinery. Powering the lighting in the in the stores, in the in the workplaces, in the entertainment places. Think of big entertainment places. How much power, energy are they consume? And if the price of that becomes not just a source of gripe, but becomes literally unpayable, you'll have to shut down, making your workers redundant, your customers bereft. That's the world that we have now moved into. Poland, I'm not so sure what their game is. Germany, Mario, I'm absolutely certain will rue the day that they join this war with Russia. Let's see if there are more. Kel Jones says, UK is more rapidly anti-Russia than the US. This might be the one case where the vassal state of the UK is wagging the dog of the U.S. Well, Kel, that, that's a very good point, and it's absolutely true, but it isn't the first case. In fact, the invasion of Libya by NATO was driven by Britain and France, not by the United States. And now President Obama uh, describes it as the biggest mistake of his presidency. It was the British government and the French government whose then president Sarkozy has been sentenced to prison for illegal campaign financing and who was up to his eyeballs in corrupt practice with the former regime in Libya. Uh, they were the ones that drove that conflict. Ditto, I think, in Yugoslavia. I think that Germany and Britain and France drove the conflict in Yugoslavia uh, even more strongly than they did in the United States. I'm not, of course, I'd be the last man to exculpate uh, the United States from these crimes. Uh, but I just don't think it's the first time that this has happened. Uh, I, I missed a donation there from uh, Mazar. Was it Mazar? Can we go back to that? We'll uh, try and get back to it. Michael, yeah. Maziar Gavadiel, $20. Thank you, Maziar. I appreciate that very much indeed. You can take a holiday for a few weeks now uh, on uh, the donations. Michael uh, Kelhar, I think it is, Kelhar. James Baker back in 1990 said, not one inch east. Proves that Yankee Doodle can't be trusted. Gorbachev did us all a favor by ending the Cold War. They stabbed him in the back. Well, I don't know what, what kind of favor it was, but there's no doubt that they stabbed him in the back. More fool him for not getting it in a treaty form, but then I regard him as a fool in any case. Uh, but that's a subject perhaps for another debate, another night. James Baker, voluminously in his memoirs, records. Uh, the uh, promises that were made uh, to the Soviet leadership, to the Russian leadership at that time, not one inch east, as you say, sir. And, of course, 
<laughs> they've gone not just one inch east of Germany. They have attempted to park their nuclear missiles on Russia's lawn, at Russia's, below Russia's battlements, uh, to quote Lord Palmerston. And no one, to quote Lord Palmerston, will ever allow their enemy to park their weapons underneath their battlements. Uh, any others? I'm sorry, it's just a little distance away from me. Russia said that Poland, Bulgaria's quota of gas will be deducted from the flow to Europe. So if Germany sells gas to Poland, it will have to, have to come out of Germany's gas take, which Germany won't want to do. Well, Claude, me, uh, you have educated me. I didn't know that. Uh, but that is a significant new development, if accurate, uh, and uh, changes some of what I had to say just a few minutes ago. Uh, if you won't pay in rubles, uh, then you won't get Russian gas, and you might not be able to get German gas or the gas of other European partners either. I understand from someone this evening that Russian oil is flooding the black market in oil. Uh, millions of barrels a day are now being sold on the black market. Extra, the, uh, the OPEC uh, channels. And someone pointed out that the oil price would be about $200 uh, dollars per barrel right now if it wasn't for that Russian black market uh, oil. Let's see. Pedrinho says, what can those of us who would prefer to live in a Britain which embraces the rising eastern powers do to address the rising tide of anti-Eastern sentiment being infused in British society at present. Very beautifully written, Pedrinho, and uh, it's a $64,000 question, of course. If I knew the full answer to it, I'd, I'd be in power now. Uh, we must cry out against it on every platform, using every method that we can. I'm the leader of the Workers' Party of Britain. It's our program. Uh, and if you feel strongly about it, you should check out our program and perhaps join us. Uh, it's a fun outfit to be with, apart from anything else. Very fine men and women of all backgrounds, all ages. A lot of ex-servicemen, for example. Uh, working class people uh, of all kinds and the finest of them, the salt of the uh, British working class. Uh, but we uh, get the government that we vote for. We get the opposition that we vote for. And we've got a government and opposition which could scarcely have been more low grade at any time in the history of this country. We can't all emigrate to the East. I can, of course. I could find lots of work in the East. My wife is Indonesian. My three children with her are half Indonesian. Two of my other children are half Arab children. I could, but we can't all relocate to the East. We have to live in the country we're in. We have to fight for the country we are in. We can't imagine ourselves somewhere else some other time from now. We have to face the reality that this is where we are and this is where we must fight. Um, but it's uh, not all is lost, I'd say to you, Pedrinho. I'm absolutely convinced. I don't have polling data on it. Oddly, there isn't any. Uh, but I have lots of anecdotal evidence. Uh, that the high point of support uh, for Boris Johnson's attitude to the East, Russia, China, Ukraine, has well and truly passed. Uh, I spoke to a friend of mine just yesterday uh, near Bristol, who told me that his barber, uh, who isn't a political guy, uh, was viscerally critical. Uh, and felt that we'd been had. And there are more and more people beginning to realize that we've been had and that none of us, none of this is in our interest. So all is not last, lost. The 
the gloss is falling off uh, the Western war narrative. And when they try to get people to go to war over the Solomon Islands or Transnistria, I promise you they're going to find that very difficult indeed. Let me take some more. Uh, Darren Hoyt says Musk needs to buy YouTube. Well, I think he's probably bought all he's going to buy uh, at the moment. $43 billion he paid for Twitter, which is a lot of money for a blackboard, which is effectively what an interactive blackboard, which is what the uh, Twitter is. Uh, I'm glad that uh, Musk bought it. After all, it wasn't exactly owned by the uh, Franciscans uh, before. It was owned by Vanguard and Morgan Stanley and BlackRock and the Saudi royal family before. I see a parade of fools protesting that an oligarch has bought Twitter, but it was already owned by oligarchs who employed a phalanx of the uh, skinny jeaned uh, liberals in San Francisco and in London, who padded around in their sneakers on, in some cases, $17 million a year salary, 17 million, to police Twitter, to marginalize uh, people like me, to suspend us, to shadow ban us, to smear us, with fake Russian affiliated media labels, which this very week in Dublin, their world headquarters, I wonder what first attracted the Saudi royal family and BlackRock and Morgan Stanley and the other owners as well of Twitter to Dublin as their world headquarters. Is that what James Connolly fought for? They were there for the tax breaks, if you don't get my drift. And we've begun legal action against them in Dublin, demanding uh, the immediate removal of this fake label they put on me on Twitter. And I have very fine lawyers, KRW Human Rights Law in Ireland, and I'm absolutely confident that this is a case we will win. because. I'm not Russian state affiliated media. I wasn't before when I had programs that I made for Associated Press, for example, that did appear on Russian media, but were produced, directed, and edited by the American multinational Associated Press. But they gave me this label after I ceased to have any shows that ever appeared on Russian uh, television or radio channels. So it just seems to me a case that cannot be defended, and I fully expect them to settle it out of court. But I warn you, Elon, I don't come cheap. Uh, George Ruiz uh, gives $4.99. Thank you, sir. I really appreciate that. Thank you, Mr. Galloway, for providing an alternative to Western propaganda. What's your opinion of President AMLO and Mexico nationalizing lithium? I didn't know about the nationalization of lithium, but I'm in favor of all governments of the South and the East controlling the commanding heights of their economy, the essential parts of their economy. There's plenty of room for uh, private sector, private capitalism in, in the uh, other parts of the economy, but the commanding heights of the economy, and lithium would seem to me likely to be one of them, should be in a public ownership. President Amlo, I'm not an expert. Uh, I'd say as an amateur enthusiast, He's quite good, but he could do better. That would be how I'd sum him up. Uh, D. Schultz says France had a rigged election as usual. Well, I haven't seen any evidence uh, 
of that, although I'm open to it, and I did speculate on moats, that just like uh, Joe Biden's victory over Donald Trump, it could well be that Macron's election was one they just simply could not afford to lose and would do anything to avoid losing, and I mean anything to avoid losing. Uh, me, my main takeaway from the French election is that Macron represents uh, about 25% of French society, and even some of that uh, would prefer differences in his approach, for example, to the retirement age issue. People voted for Macron, even though he's about to make you work until you're 68 instead of 65, he's taking away many of the gains that the working people in France have made through bitter struggle over many decades past. But some of them still voted for him because they didn't like the cut of the jib uh, of the opposition. It's really not much to write home about that you got 58% of the vote when your opponent was somebody called Le Pen from the dynasty of Vichy France fascist collaboration with the German occupation of your country. Uh, that's not a great result, you know. But my main takeaway is the dunces to the left. Mélenchon would not just comfortably have been into the final ballot, but would have been in the leading candidate in the final ballot if a collection of clown candidates standing for the far left had not stood against them and asked their supporters to vote for Mélenchon. And they include, I'm very sorry to say, the once proud PCF, the Communist Party of France, who put up a candidate against Mélenchon, who got a risible, pathetic, laughable vote. But that vote, if added to Mélenchon's, would have put him in to the final ballot. And there was the usual collection of Trotskyite lunatics, each of them getting enough votes uh, to put Mélenchon over the line. And the final ballot would have been Mélenchon versus Macron. And Mélenchon would have been today sitting in the Élysée Palace. And a very great deal of difference would have been made. I don't believe this is the final chapter in France. Apart from anything else, the parliamentary elections come along very quickly, within a month, and I'm sure that Mélenchon will win those and he'll be the prime minister. And that will be a very unhappy cohabitation indeed. And moreover, it will cause a great deal of stress and strain in France's relations with the European Union and perhaps particularly with NATO. And the Yellow Vests and the people of France are back on the streets, as only the French people can in the European continent. And I wish them every success in their demands. I've got seven minutes. Uh, Philip Coos, C-O-O-Z-E, says, this is better than Sunday's show. We get more how Gigi thinks and is truthful. Thanks, Philip. I'm always truthful, uh, but it is a bit more intimate. There's no wells, uh, there's no uh, bells and whistles. Uh, there's only one camera. There's only a couple of lights. And there's only me and my missus here in the studio that isn't a studio. It is my front room. There's no music, there's no stings, there's no breaks, uh, there's no fancy camera work and all that. It's more intimate, more raw. And some people, I think, uh, like that. And I carry on, by the way, for a little while uh, after the show on my Patreon page, which is patreon.com forward slash George Galloway. You can head over there now. And if you do, you'll be supporting my efforts, which are ceaseless, let me assure you, to build an independent media presence in this corrupted media world, one that can never be cut off by YouTube, who've always been fair to me, uh, I must say. They're not fair to everybody. They're not fair to some of my friends, but they've always been fair to me. And that's why I'm doing this show on YouTube. 
but that could change. You know, Twitter might get annoyed at me defeating them in court and knock me off Twitter. Uh, the uh, former Deputy uh, Prime Minister of Britain, Sir Nick Clegg, who now runs the political side of Facebook, might uh, start to think about some of the cruel things I said to him over the years in Parliament and out and knock me off Facebook. I could be knocked off the platforms that I'm on. So the two things to follow me on, which, if you like, are my last redoubt, are my Telegram channel, t.me forward slash George Galloway, and my patreon.com forward slash George Galloway. But time for another couple, uh, if they can be put on the screen. Uh, Eva Green says, please talk about the horrendous state-sponsored violence against Indian Muslims and the impending genocide that they are threatened with. I don't think I could do that justice in this uh, hour. I've only got three and a bit minutes to go, Eva. But I view things in India with grave concern. Communal violence uh, launched by fanatics is a perennial danger in India. And I see videos from India that make my blood run cold. And I am paying particular attention to the situation of Muslims in India. And I promise that next week, perhaps, we'll return to that in the time that it deserves. Uh, Flat Racing Guru UK gives £10. Thank you, Racing Guru. Is that horse racing? In which case, contact me later. George, you're a hero. Biden and Boris are using Ukraine as a proxy fund. That money will end up back in Biden's election fraud fund. I kid you not. Well, I did notice this week <clears throat> that the tax authorities are querying $5 million of unexplained wealth in Joe Biden's uh, records. And I'm querying it too. I wouldn't mind betting uh, that it came from a business dealing with uh, Ukraine, uh, but also with Russia and China. Don't believe that these people, because they hate Russia and China, are above making money uh, from dealings in Russia and China. That definitely is not true. I love Russia and China, and I'm not involved in any business with either of them. But I can sleep at night. Now, maybe two more. Uh, Akram Nasser Bakht says, cancel your Netflix subs to support GG, as I did, if you don't want to lose this invaluable source of information. Thank you, Akram. I, I wouldn't ask anyone to do that, uh, not least because a friend of mine is the head of Netflix in Britain and Ireland. Not that it's done me any good getting my films on the platform. But it's only a pound, that's all pound a week. That's much less than a Netflix sub. Pound a week is all I'm asking you for. You'll never lose this Galloway show. This is uh, no budget TV. It's free to air and uh, entirely free to view. Uh, but I worry about the mother of all talk shows. If we didn't get a sponsor over the next, say, four weeks or so, uh, then we'll be utterly dependent on you donating uh, in order to keep the show going. We've already stripped it down. We've laid people off. Uh, we are a skeleton staff. My family, my friends, my grandson and his girlfriend work the phones. Uh, my wife is running around hither and thither. Uh, we, we've really stripped it down. Uh, but we do need to raise that stripped-down money every week. Uh, one more. Time for one more. Uh, Le Chat gives five euros. Thank you, Kat. I appreciate it. I also like this format more. Thank you, George. Well, thank you, Le Chat. My children were delighted that I came back from Bristol with a new addition for the family. 
a little black and white cat called Chess. I'll put her on screen, maybe, or a picture of her on screen or online in the next day or two. Thanks very much for watching. Thank you for those who donated to Moats. And if you're on Patreon, you can follow me there now. In five minutes, I'll uh, take my shoes off, kick back, chew my nicotine gum, and talk even more intimately than this. Thank you for being with me this evening.